Okay, so at this point we've got the shell of these various screens. Stuff will go in the home screen, of course. View comics, save comics. View comics will be dynamic. It will update itself based on what we've already saved. Save comics, we can set up to this point um, as our interface to save data uh, about the comics. This is going to be a form. So in, up to this point in part one in the class, we will be able to collect certain amount of information. Uh, and then we will, we will be able to collect more information in part two of the class. Uh, what we will get to in part two would be, for example, a photo of the, uh, of the comic and scanning the barcode and that sort of thing. So uh, we'll create a form here. Let's uh, go to PG Save Comic. And let's see here, under, in PG Save Comic, we've got the div that I copied back from PG View Comic. We don't, we don't need this div, actually, or the comment. So under PG Save Comic, let's empty out this article. What we're going to do instead is create a form. A form is a way for a user to input information. We use the form in uh, logging in and signing up. We're going to use a form to collect the b various bits of information of the comic. In order for us to then read what's inside of the form, via JavaScript. Once again, we use an ID. We'll call this form save comic. With an ID, uh, we can use JavaScript to read what's here. And we've seen also the ID is good for the href and also CSS. It has several purposes or several uses. Um, we're going to divide up this form into a couple of sections, a section of required information and a set of optional information. So if you were going to save a database of anything, most likely you have a few things that are required and a few things that are optional. If we're going to save comics, what do you think is an important thing that is required to be saved about a comic? The title. The title of the comic. Good. Anything else? What's that? The author, maybe, sure. <coughs> the year, main characters and such. So we have a variety of things that we can save as required or optional. So we've seen that we can create input fields that are set to required and those that are not required. And then the person will have to fill them out or not. Well, in order for us to divide up what is required or not, we'll employ here a field set. We're going to group together things optionally and required. What we get with field set is we put a legend, which is the visual indicator of what this section is on screen. Well, this, this field set, this group of information is the required info, the required inputs. Therefore, logically, what we do for the second field set is add a legend that says optional. When we save things to a database, there needs to be unique identifiers to separate this bit of data from that bit of data. So we're going to use uh, three required fields to take care of that. 
Um, we'll, we'll write them very generally here, then we'll write the correct markup. We're going to ask for the title of the comic, the number of the comic, and its year. All three of these are enough to, to uniquely identify any comic, because throughout the history of comics, um, there have been several instances, for example, of Superman number one. There was one in 1940, there was one like in 1980, there was one in 2012, 2016. There's been different versions of the same comic. Same thing with you know, Spider-Man number one, 1962, 1999, 2014. There's been different versions of the same comic. So if we were only asking for like the title of the comic, that would might conflict. There's more than one issue of you know, Mighty Mouse number one. So, okay, just not, um, the title and number is not enough. The year is also important because then now there's only one instance of Superman number one, 1940. There's no other example of that from the same year. So these are the three things that are going to be required in, in this part of the form. In the optional part, we're going to ask for publisher. <coughs> So Marvel Comics, DC Comics, Image Comics, etc. Uh, and then notes, like our notes, uh, our, our ideas, our, our own info that we want to write about a particular comic. And there's going to be a few other fields that we'll get to in part two. There's going to be a field where we can scan the barcode of the comic using the device's camera. And we'll also be able to um, take a photo uh, of the cover or an inside page or something. So there'll be more input fields that we'll get to in part two of the class. We're able to create these ones at the moment because they're text-based. Well, these things that uh, we're asking for, these are going to be labels that appear. on screen. So we've got a label tag around each one of these. So we're going to need a label on all four more of these. Go ahead and add those. Copy and paste, write them by hand, whatever. But you'll need labels for all of these five input fields. So with a little copy and paste, you could paste in each of these quickly. End the label. So we've got, we've got oops, not legend, sorry, label. Oh okay, yeah, label right there. Yes, so labels on each one of those. Start the label, end the label. Each one of these will be right next to an input field. Except for note, that one will be a little different. Get to that one in just a moment. Okay, so if this label is related to this input, we have to set up, as we've seen before, a label for attribute and then the input's name and ID attribute. So on our first one here, label 4, let's say in title. This is an input field. This is for an input field that asks for title. Well, there's the input field. So its name is in title.
we're also going to use IDs on these inputs so that when the person clicks submit or save, the JavaScript kicks in to read what's in those fields. And it's perfectly fine to use the exact same name and for attribute. So now I need the same thing here. For in number, for in year, for in publisher, and for in notes. And the next one, for in number. In year. In publisher. In notes. Question. Yeah, what is four for? Um, so that this label, this text. So that this text is associated with this input field. So that when the browser or the app processes it, it knows that the data inside of this element is related with, to this element, that this data is being used for this element. So uh, the ID, what we use is ID for the Well, ID is uh, so that we can use the JavaScript. So that we can, uh, when someone clicks submit, uh, we can use the JavaScript to then search and find the input named in title, extract whatever they wrote into it, and then use it in JavaScript. So it's basically for and name are just we we have to use them. This is the right way to do it. We use for and title to link label and name. Uh, we use for and name to link those together. Then we have ID as a way for using JavaScript to read what's inside of the field. And naming them all three exactly the same just keeps it easier for us. They could all, uh, ID could be different than name, but name should be the same as for. So same thing on this next one. This is going to be name in number, ID in number. The next one for year, same thing. Name in year, ID in year. And then the last two, in publisher, notes is going to be a little bit different, so we'll do that one in a moment. Um, so um, these are labels that are being used for these inputs right here. Um, we should specify that the kind of data that we're accepting into these inputs. Now, I said previously, I recommend, this is just my way of doing it, and I recommend this way, I recommend to always leave ID as the very last attribute whenever you add an ID. So I need to add other attributes. Therefore, I'm going to add them before ID. And 
if I'm using an ID plus a name, I like to keep those as the last two items. So we're going to add a brand new attribute before name, before ID. A type attribute. The type of data we can accept into this input field. We'll say text. And text can include numbers as well. So here would be the, um, the title of the comic, and we're accepting it as any sort of text. So then it's also useful to put the placeholder. How should a person write into this? Placeholder is very useful to guide people. This is what you should write into this field. So here we'll just put the name of any comic, Iron Man. The number of the comic. Um, well, the number of the comic, this is a different input type. I don't want the person to put x or the word 17, not the number. I mean, the number, not the word. So in this case, we've got the type of number. What should happen here is that the uh, input field should only accept numbers. And this works best on a mobile device. It, it'll automatically, uh, when a person uh, taps onto that field, they'll automatically get the keyboard that is only numbers. On a web browser, some browsers treat that a little differently. Firefox shows it a certain way, Chrome another way. But on mobile devices, it's pretty smart because it only shows number inputs. And that's what I want. I want them to put a, a, a number, a real number. We can put a placeholder there. Uh, whatever, number 333. So um, next is year. Year is also a number. So we'll have a type of number. Placeholder. I think this is 1994 or so. So here's an example. Put the name of a comic put the year of it, uh, put the number of it in these three different inputs. If you take a quick look at it in the browser, just to see how it's coming together, go ahead and save it and view it in your browser. Save a comic. You've got an area required, an area optional. This can all be styled, of course. Um, title number year. Um, we've got the placeholders there. We can type anything we want, of course. Publisher. We'll set a publisher in a moment too, and then notes. With notes, I want a little bit more space for the person to write notes. Right now it's just one line. For these other items, we can set up more space for them to write notes. So that's a different type of input. It's a text area, exactly. So um, if you go over to notes, Instead of input, we've got a, another one, a different one called text area. This should have a pair, unlike input. Input uh, is a self-closing element. Text area is two tags. So when this was invented back in 1990 or 89 or so, for whatever reason, text area was designed a little bit differently. You just have to memorize or practice that text area 
for multiple lines of input is different. It's two tags, but it still works the same with, uh, with a name and an ID. In notes, in notes, And as we created up above, well, we had uh, we had type and placeholder. Um, we can put a placeholder in notes, but not not really a type. And we need a type for the publisher. So for publisher, it's text placeholder Marvel for text area. We don't really need a type, but we can put a placeholder if we want. And then some sort of placeholder text. Uh, the anniversary issue. So now when you view this, we've got the um, we've got these various inputs. So viewing it in the browser, I get this. I get um, I get the placeholder stuff, and the notes looks like I can have multiple lines, whereas the other ones doesn't exactly create multiple lines. more things for this uh, form to be complete. Um, if I want to start over, I need a reset button or a clear button to clear those fields. If I'm done, I need a submit button to start the process of saving the info. And technically, I haven't really said anything as required. I've made these fields in a field set area of required, but it doesn't behave those three don't behave like required inputs yet. So we need to add the attribute of required. Let's go back to our required area. We have input type text and placeholder and then name. Anywhere we add it, I'll say after placeholder, required. For each of those three. Technically, if you want it to be completely aesthetic, I believe the full syntax is required equals required. Or possibly required equals true. But um, just leave it as required. So now those three in the required section are actually required. A person will have to fill those in if they want to submit their, um, their comic, their data. To reset or to save the data, we have the, the buttons to do that. Um, after the field sets, we've got the required and we've got the optional field set. Here we'll set up some buttons. Um, 
input value reset input value save So the save and the reset buttons work a little different. You don't need labels because their values are the visible content. But these inputs right now don't know that they're acting like buttons, specifically reset and save buttons. So we have here type reset, lowercase on that. And to save, We have submit. If we look at this in the browser, now that we've got required fields, these will highlight to show you haven't filled them in, if, especially if you try to save. If you actually then fully try to save it, you will get the XML parsing error that's normal. <clears throat> we haven't programmed it so that it actually submits. So if it then resets you back to home or PG welcome, that's normal. The submit form is not working yet. We're still filling in the, we're still creating the, the default design of it, not the functionality. Uh, speaking of design, uh, this reset and save looks all right, but I think it's takes up too much space here. I like them side by side. The default is that these input buttons will behave like block level elements. They will take up their own full amount of space. Since I wrote reset first and then save second, it pushed save second. So I want them on the same line. And one way we can do this is we can actually, via jQuery Mobile, create grids on the screen to create a two column layout, three column, six column layout. We can divide up the screen equally uh, to display content. So I want to divide up this little area down here in half so that the reset button and the save button are on the same line, just half and half. So we have here, uh, you don't have to look at this, we'll, we'll just do it, but in jQuery Mobile there is a, a little um, uh, a tutorial here about grids. Uh, we'll do this in a moment. And basically, you can create these grids that are half and half. You can put stuff inside of them. You can do three at once, up to six, I think. So, and then three by nine grids. And you can just make grids and put different content into them. Right now, it's very basic what it is. Um, but uh, we can use these grids that will automatically respond, grow, and shrink depending on their content. So, uh, the basic idea is that uh, we can do like a two column grid and uh, we're going to use these divs with a UI block, block A and B and such, with a grid. So we're going to divide up our screen in a grid. The way we'll do this is I want the reset button on the left side, left column, and the save on the right side. Well, before that, let's make some space. Let's make some space before that. These are the right buttons, but we need the grid code and then we'll put the we'll move these into the grid code. So the way the grid code will work is we've got a div, a generic container, which then gets upgraded with a class. Now not a data role, a class. We've got these grids. 
rows and columns. This is, I think, one of the ones that is named the weirdest of all. You just have to memorize it. It's got to be a class, not a data role. And we've got grid A, B, C, and D, depending on how many columns and rows. So um, they should have called it, you know, div data role grid one or two. They should have used something a little smarter, I think. But okay, this is going to create a grid. Each particular um, cell in the grid then is going to be a block. So grid A is basically that it's one row of a grid. B is that we would have two rows, and then C is three, etc. Well, each, uh, each uh, cell, so to speak, then is going to be a block. And these are also set up as divs. Even though, even though they're on separate lines, both of these are going to be in the same row, grid A, or row A. Remember to mute your devices, please. So we're going to have here uh, class UI dash block A. And the other one is a class of block B. The first cell, the second cell. And what's going to go in the cell is the button. So cut and paste, or actually you can drag and drop. If you select a row, if you select some code, you can just then click it and drag it into place. You can do that in Notepad, not in other software, but definitely in Notepad. So anyway, move your reset into block A, and move your save into block B. You see here, if I select it, I can just drag it. I can select the code and drag it into place. So the difference here is if you if you view this result now, you get a reset and a save button on the same row via the grids. We've created this two-column layout down there. The grid is invisible until you put content into it or style it via CSS. And because we're using jQuery Mobile, we can attach uh, buttons to, um, or ic icons, that is, to the buttons. We didn't have to do data roll button because it knows that when you've got an input field of a reset or a submit, it's a button. So it behaves like a button. So what you could do is, uh, in addition to these values, data icon. We have one called delete and one called check.
So now I've got some icons here. Uh, as I'm starting to fill this in and I click reset, it resets. If I try to click something and click save, if I have nothing in those boxes, it'll tell me they're missing. If I do fill something in here, and then try to uh, submit, um, you'll see that uh, publisher and notes are optional, so it'll let me. But then if I then try to save, uh, I'll get an error, which is normal. It hasn't been fully set up yet. When we, uh, when we save a comic, we're going to want to have uh, some feedback uh, about that we saved a comic. So um, like we did previously for other feedback regarding pop-ups, we're going to create a, um, a pop-up text in this screen. And we saw previously that whenever we wanted any, any pop-ups to happen, they should be in the same section where we use them. So let's go outside of the form before the end of article. We'll create a new div here. There'll be a message that says comic saved. Once those fields are filled in, once we set up the functionality, we click Save, and a pop-up will appear that says Comic Saved. Little feedback that the comic was saved. Well, in order for this to behave like a pop-up, we need to add the other bit of markup here to make it behave like a pop-up. Data role. Pop-up. Class UI content so it's not transparent. And then an ID so we can call it via JavaScript. We'll call this pop comic saved. Okay, so to uh, when you test this, you should not see the comic saved text appear. If it is appearing, that means your your markup isn't quite right. Uh, comic saved will only appear after you click save once we fully programmed it. Uh, so if your text does appear down at the bottom, it's not quite right. Uh, but here's our our save comic screen.
So once we get past the uh, login mechanism, we have your save comic, view comic. Nothing in view comic yet. Save comic, the input fields are being set up. The functionality of it won't work yet. And we have a pop-up that's invisible down here that will appear eventually once we click Save. These are our fields here. We're going to have more fields a little bit later in part two of the class. As I said, once we upgrade this to uh, device project, um, we will be able to scan barcodes, um, <coughs> take photos of the item, save GPS data and such, and all that other great stuff. Uh, that'll be in part two. Uh, we'll take one more break, then we'll uh, set up a little bit more in the front end of the project, uh, and then we'll, we'll look at something uh, interesting regarding uh, colors and design, which will be part of the first assessment, which will be on Thursday, which I'll talk about after the break. So, 7.55, we'll take a break until 8.05, and then we'll go on.